of textiles and with smart textiles also, uh, which is an initiative um, very much into taking research results and uh, trying to um, put the ideas and the results on a production line and making uh, products and new services out of that. So the theme of today is, uh, or today, but also the coming hour is very interesting uh, for me. I hope it is very interesting for you as well. Uh, and we have a very prominent list of uh, participants and, uh, and speakers today. We have um, Anna Lefebvre-Sjöldebrandt. She is a CEO of the Swedish MedTech organization, which is the uh, association for uh, companies uh, within um, uh, medical technology in Sweden, um, spanning spanning a, 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 a wide a wide spectrum of companies. Uh, it's very nice to have um, Professor Richard Lordner here, who has a very successful uh, history in um, in computer science. Uh, but also, when complementing that, has been working with access technology. Uh, then we are very pleased also to have Daniel uh, Bragg uh, among us, who is um, a researcher at Microsoft Research. And then uh, Jarek Urbanski at, uh, at Harpo, which is uh, based in Poznan, Poland, uh, and part of the suitcase project. Uh, who has a long experience working with academia and also um, uh, producing um, brailers and different kind of communication devices. Very nice to have you all here, and uh, I'm very uh, eager to hear you all. Uh, so we take one presentation at a time. Hello, my name is Anna Lefebvre Sjöldebrand. I am the chief executive of Swedish MedTech, the industry association for the medical device companies in Sweden. I want to start off with thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk on this very important event. Today I will talk about how does a product reach the market, a short overview of the major obstacles, I will give you an introduction to a few obstacles that many producers of technology encounters when the products are to get to the market and the end user, the patient. First, I want to very quickly talk about the healthcare systems and the drivers because in reality, in most European countries and many other countries all over the world, healthcare is a political organization to a smaller or larger extent. That means that decisions on what technology to supply to people, uh, what is included in the health system and what is not. It's very often a political decision. Another important factor is of course economy. Healthcare is often considered to be a cost driving sector. Uh, unfortunately, it's very seldom considered to be a sector to invest in, in order to improve the health outcome for the population and create a stronger and healthier society with more inclusion and more equality. Another area that is important to understand is that the organization of healthcare is based on how organization has been looking for many years and it is not always optimized for new technologies and new ways of working. Also, the healthcare professionals are, of course, key in the healthcare system and in a system where we are talking about 
assistive technology. Healthcare professionals are trained and have very good knowledge, but we are very well aware of that this knowledge is all the time growing and there is a constant need of, to, of getting new <coughs> experiences and especially new knowledge. We need to be trained all through our careers. And that is something that is not always the case when it comes to healthcare professionals. Patients are of course in the center of the healthcare systems. And here it's important to recognize that the patient is actually the key driver for the whole system as such. And there is a shift today where the patient, the individual, the person is more and more getting a chance to own its own health. And this change is also something affecting uh, how technologies are getting from idea to the patient. The thing is that a lot of good technologies are invented, uh, but they do never reach the patient or the healthcare. How come? How can it be like this? Uh, there are, of course, some framework conditions that are important to understand. One important thing is that when we talk about new technologies, new products, it is very often also needed to have new competences and new skills in order to utilize the new technology. It's also evident that many of the products today, when we are looking at assistive technology products, are based on software. Either software is an integral part of the product or it might be a standalone software. That means that this product has to work together with other systems and products in the ecosystem. And therefore, interoperability is required, something that is very much depending on standardization. We also have one area that has been growing, and that is privacy and the fact that a number of products are gathering information about the users. And this is important in order to get the best possible functionality from the product. But it's also then very important to make sure that privacy is always thought about and the data relating to a person, we know where it's stored, how it is used and who is owning the data. Lastly, but not of least importance is of course regulatory issues. There are a number of regulations that are important to understand uh, if you really want to be successful in bringing a product to the market. Another thing that is, of course, important when it comes to implementing new technology, it is social acceptance. We're talking about products that have to be accepted by both users and the patients. That means that healthcare professionals have to see the advantages in the product for the users and they have to acknowledge this and see that this product actually is bringing health and well-being, inclusion or equality to the persons they are working to help. We also know that in very many cases, new technology also requires new work processes. These new work processes require both resources and money to obtain. And a lack of functional work processes actually stops a lot of new products from reaching the end user. We also have market access problems. If you want to bring a product to the market, 
You have to be aware of reimbursement models. And these models look different in different countries. They can even be different in different regions in a country. And for medical device products such as assistive technology, in many countries, it is required to go through a public procurement process with a product in order to get the product on the market and to the end user, the patient. So when we are looking at this, are there only problems? No, of course, but there are a few things that we have to really set properly for both the healthcare and for the innovator of the new technology. One thing is, of course, that the technology is really meeting the real needs for the user, the patient, and the healthcare. And we have to then realize that these new technologies are changing roles and also, as I already said, it changes processes. And that has to be included in, in implementation of new technology. We have to understand reimbursement. We have to know who is the payer. Is it the patient? Is it the healthcare system or the insurance system? Or is it divided over both? And we have to know the regulation that you have to fulfill in order to put your product on the market in the country where you want the patients to actually be able to access. And this is something you have to know already very early in the designing of a product. This was a very short introduction to some of the obstacles you might encounter bringing new technology to patients and healthcare. And I want to thank you for listening to this speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very important messages there and that are really addressing and uh, that um, many of the things uh, that we are addressing here are, are products that, that are uh, under di different forms of uh, regulatory uh, frames, which is very important to follow, of course. Good. Uh, I hope that we could continue with the next presentation here. Hello, Yulitsa. Great to see you. Hello. Um, I want to introduce you to the audience. This is Yulitsa Nusio. Uh, she's deafblind herself. Uh, she's also a deafblind leader in the deafblind community and beyond. Uh, she's the founder of Tactile Communications, which started in Seattle, in my area. Uh, she's now a teacher at the Western uh, Oregon State University. Um, and I'm going to start by um, asking you, Litsa, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself <clears throat> and then tell us about what is ProTactyl and why it's so important. Sure. Well, hello. Thanks for that introduction, Richard, and for inviting me to participate with all of you. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this. It's a great opportunity for me to be able to share with you um, some of our very valued, really cherished protactile language um, that members of the deafblind community uh, in the United States uh, are using more and more. So protactile um, involves language and it's language that comes from uh, directly emerging from a tactile ground. And there's different aspects of that. I, right now I'm doing some protactile language research, um, studying phonology of protactile language. Um, also training protactile interpreters to work with deafblind people. 
Mm-hmm. So who are we as deaf blind people and who um, are the users of protectal language? There are many deaf blind people all over the world. I'm gonna be focusing on those of us who live here in the United States. We are a diverse group. And the protectile movement came from the intuitions of those of us in the deafblind community. It emerged in Seattle, where there is a critical mass of deafblind people. And over the years, we've been sort of relegated to receiving uh, information and communicating information through American Sign Language that was perceived tactily, but nevertheless, the language is a visual one. And so we didn't have access to a lot of the spatial dimensions of the language, a lot of the spatial references that the language uses. And if we were to move into a more tactile realm, we would be communicating through Braille, which again is based on spoken language, uh, which is a second language to many of us. So over the years, we all felt the need to get together directly with one another, not depending on interpreters, but developing our own autonomy. Oftentimes members of the deafblind community, we will um, become really isolated because again, we're depending upon other people to give us access to a language that isn't accessible to us. And the how that robs us of our autonomy um, is, is just very, very pervasive. Um, and we don't want to be depending upon people's eyes to give us information or on other people's ears, what they're hearing to give us information. Neither of those two things are reliable sources of information for us. So what we thought we would do is get in touch directly with one another and with our environment. When things are communicated directly, they're much more concrete. Uh, than when people are telling us what's happening over there or between person A and person B who we aren't in touch with. Now virtually, um, when people are using um, video phones or remote technology, uh, Zoom, for example, like, you know, the features of our language disappear yeah. um, and aren't accessible because it takes two people to communicate in protactile. Mm-hmm. So 14 yeah. years ago, when the protactile movement emerged in Seattle, mm-hmm. Washington, we recognized that this increased reliance on interpreters um, came with a cost and that again was diminishing uh, our own autonomy and our own direct connection and communication with one another in the community. And it was a very long process. If we would all get together, there would just be um, an interpreter with every deafblind person, if you can imagine, and we would all be getting information secondhand. And instead, we wanted to get in touch directly. And when the protactile movement came about, we all wanted to address what being protactile people meant. And it meant not getting information through finger spelling, for example, that was not readily perceptible. Because again, these hand shapes that American Sign Language uses are discernible to the eye, not to touch necessarily. And so, there are people who um, developed code-based communication systems like haptics, for example, but those were really devised um, for one-way communication. Again, always a person like an interpreter or someone giving information about the environment or about others to the deafblind person, never the deafblind person sharing information about our experiences, about our world with others. And so with protactile language, I get information through a person's hand, through their movement, through the pressure that they're yeah. touching me with, um, through you know the feeling that they're giving me. All of their facial expressions or their tone is communicated through touch, and it's a reciprocal language. So I'm not the only one feeling the person who's giving me information, but the person who I'm communicating with is also feeling me, right? So I'm feeling being felt in language. And that was revolutionary 14 years ago. So a hearing person, a sighted person, to communicate with me in protactile would be connecting and touching me just as I am touching them. They would be giving information to me tactically just as I'm giving information to them. And as this language has emerged, we recognize different grammatical features. Features that emerged 
within the language and <laughs> diverge from American Sign Language uh, phonologically. Mm -hmm. And so that linguistic mm -hmm. research um, has been going on for some time mm -hmm. and we're still mm -hmm. conducting research. And so as a deafblind mm -hmm. community, as a protactile mm -hmm. community, we're coming together. We're recognizing the diversity in our community, um, the, the different backgrounds that people have and bring to our community, and the fact that touch is something that can be depended upon. Touch is where we get our information. It's not about auditory language or visual language that we may or may not have access to. Right, or people drawing pictures or trying to trace outlines on our hands. Those things are not uh, intuitively the way that we connect with our world and with one another. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes left. And I'm just like, <laughs> Sorry, I may have took more time. That's okay, it was a great, great presentation there of Protactile. But I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about how technology could support uh, Protactile communication. Is there anything that technology might be able to help with for remote communication? Sure. And we only have about a minute. Okay, sure. Okay, I'll go quick. So remote communication is really, really uh, inaccessible, right? And it's hurt us tremendously. There is no ability to replace a human being when it comes to protactile language. However, there are, I think, opportunities to support or augment um, phone conversations where we are using an interpreter or a communication facilitator. Um, something, a device that could provide um, back channeling cues or feedback cues. Um, do you remember America Online a long time ago? How it was very, very different than what people are texting today. Today, there's all these emojis and people are communicating with all of this shorthand, right? And people are doing that to be able to convey their tone and their feelings uh, in a virtual environment where that's missing. So I think that that's a similar, that's an analogy to what would be useful for us. Maybe a device that vibrates, letting us know um, if something is happening on our left or our right. Um, if we're out of the house, for example, you know, and there are cars moving in our environment, um, it would be something that would need to be light, not a piece of heavy equipment that we would have to cart around, you know, but something that people could use to, to just feel each other a bit more directly in uh, remote conversations. Yeah, thank you very much for this very important uh, um, messages um yes um i think we continue there are some um, questions uh coming up some are um hello my name to. is daniel yeah. bragg and i'm a senior please continue senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Today I'll be presenting a set of projects focused on building systems in support of sign language users and low vision readers. In the past few decades, access to information has dramatically improved. The advent of personal computers and devices have ushered in a revolution in how we access information. Today we have seemingly endless resources available online, ranging from text articles to podcast audio to social media videos. Interfaces developed to support content creation, sharing, and retrieval are also available. However, these same interfaces present barriers to large groups of users. One group not served particularly well by text-based interfaces are sign language users. Sign languages are movement-based and don't have a standard written form, which means that text-based platforms can be inaccessible. There are many sign language users affected by text inaccessibility. Worldwide, there are about 70 million deaf people using a signed language as their first language, and many hearing people learn and use sign languages too. My colleagues and I were interested in making progress in this space, but first we wanted to get a better understanding of the lay of the land. So we asked a two-part question. What is the state of the art and what are the biggest challenges in sign language computation, which spans recognition, generation, and translation? To answer this question, we ran a workshop with attendees from a variety of fields 
including deaf thought leaders. We focused on five main areas fundamental to computation, data sets, recognition and computer vision, modeling and natural language processing, avatars and computer graphics, and user interface and user experience design. Ultimately, we found that the primary barrier to progress in the field is a lack of appropriate sign language data. To give you a sense of the scale of the problem, let's compare to speech corpora. The largest sign language corpuses contain fewer than 100,000 words. The largest articulated speech corpuses, which are basically recordings of speech, contain about 5 million words. And the largest annotated speech corpuses, written text, contain upwards of 1 billion words. Existing data sets suffer from a number of other limitations, including lack of fluent deaf signers, signer diversity, real world settings, complete and appropriate labeled, and continuous signing. These limitations have largely prevented training and deploying sign language models that work well for diverse signers in the real world. To help address this data problem, we have been building data collecting resources. Instead of paying people to gather data, we are collecting data through intrinsically valuable tasks, for example, a game that provides education, fun, or community. In this way, we can both create better sign language corpora while also providing valuable resources to this typically underserved community. Such tactics can also help increase, increase diversity and scalability. So here's an example of a data collecting game that we built called ASLC Battle. It's based on the traditional game of Battleship. The game is played between two players, each on their smartphone. The game starts with each player hiding a set of ships on a grid. Then each player takes turns guessing where their opponent hid their ships by attacking a square. Unlike in traditional Battleship, where each square would be referenced by a row and column number, we label each square with a sign. To attack or guess the square, a player records a video of themselves signing that sign. We also provide a model signer video so that people can view the sign that they are choosing. The video gets sent to the opponent who matches it to the correct square, thus unlocking the square to reveal whether there is a ship hidden there to their partner, and also at the same time providing a label for the recording. In building sign language corpora, privacy can become a big concern as a signer's face, body, and background appear in sign language videos. To help address privacy concerns, we've also played around with the idea of applying different filters to sign language videos. For example, a tiger head or other avatar might obscure the face, or the entire frame might be blurred or stylized. Our preliminary work suggests that such filters can indeed increase willingness to contribute to corpora in some cases, though preservation of facial expressions may be a concern. In addition to privacy, some larger ethical issues also arise in building and using sign language data sets. Some colleagues and I engaged in a project to outline these major concerns which fall broadly under the category of fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, or FATE. First, content. What is in the data set and who is represented? Second, model performance. How does the data set design impact model performance? For example, who can the model work well for? Three, use cases. What use cases or end applications do sign language data sets enable? Four, ownership. Who owns the data? What does ownership even entail? Five, access. Who can access and use the data? Six, the collection mechanism. How is the data collected and how does the collection itself impact the community? Seven, transparency and understanding. What information might people want to know and how can that be communicated clearly? Ultimately, this work underlies that in building sign language data sets and applications, it's essential to partner closely with deaf communities who will be most impacted by the work. Let's switch gears now a bit to discuss another group that encounters barriers in accessing information with modern technologies, low vision readers. 
There are about 300 million people worldwide with visual impairments, and the vast majority of them have low vision. So low vision is vision that is not near 2020 with best correction, for example, while wearing glasses. This can impact daily life, in particular, making visual reading difficult, especially on small screens. Traditional solutions to low vision reading difficulties include magnification, tactile displays, and text to speech. Each solution is limited in various ways. We wanted to see what would happen if we simply made new letter forms. Maybe redesigning our letter forms leveraging modern computer graphics could help improve legibility. To try this out, we created a set of what we call smart fonts. Smart fonts are one-to-one -one mappings between the English letters and new visual symbols. So they preserve spelling, grammar, and punctuation. They're concep conceptually similar to grade one braille. To improve legibility, we leverage chunky shapes and bold colors. We also tried adding animation to further differentiate letter forms. And we found that some designs could improve legibility, enabling people to condense text up to two times and still be legible. Many open questions in this space still remain, in particular around design, learning to read these scripts, and integrating them into everyday platforms. Inspired by our work on animating letters, we also played around with creating an animated sign language writing system. Sign languages do not have a commonly accepted written form, which introduces barriers in education and information access. Because sign languages involve distinctive movements, we hypothesized that incorporating movement in the script itself might help make it more iconic so that it visually resembles live signing. We tried this out by incorporating animation into an existing sign language writing system out of Gallaudet called SI5S. We replaced symbols representing movement with actual animation. So instead of indicating that a hand shape should move in an arc, we animate the hand shape symbol. Here's an example with the sentence, you go to school tomorrow. And here is an example of what a full page of animated text might look like. Other display modes are possible, of course, for example, animating or showing just one sign at a time and allowing the reader to scroll through. Our preliminary studies suggest that appropriate animations may indeed improve iconicity and learnability, though future work is needed in this space. For example, to figure out how to integrate such animated scripts into text platforms. So this last project comes full circle, combining work on both text and signed languages. Working with signed languages and text separately or together is a really rich space with many open problems, and I hope this work inspires others to get involved. I want to give a huge thank you to my many collaborators from Microsoft, Gallaudet University, Boston University, Rochester Institute of Technology, the University of Washington, and many other universities as well. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, I think we are uh, need to follow the, the time schedule here. So we start the, the final um, presentation in this uh, session. Hello, I'm Jarek Urbanski, the CEO of Harpo, the uh, business partner and suitcase project. Please give me a second to share my screen. Okay, I'm going to tell you about small business involvement in the scientific research, and uh, possibilities, expectations and practical achievements. One important for us uh, experience of our own company, Harpo. <laughs> Going to answer questions, how small business and science can meet each other's expectations. What did we learn from concluded and current projects? What criteria uh, for getting involved in new projects should we use? And maybe answer a question, can all projects produce products that will reach the market eventually? Assistive products market is fragmented and covers groups of products that are not similar to one to the other at all. Uh, let's take an example of hearing aids and braille equipment. 
both very different. The here in case market is definitely a major one and integrated, uh, while braille equipment not at all. Visual aids and uh, wheelchair uh, cannot compare one to the other. It's enough to see uh, Rehacker and uh, Düsseldorf, where uh, wheelchairs are accommodated on thousands of square meters, while uh, visual aids on, on, are only on a small angle. And that's not only because the visual aids are just smaller. Uh, the market for special groups of persons with disabilities like deaf, deaf blindness, uh, they, uh, the market is uh, uh, very small and the volume of potential sales is minimal and based on single purchasing projects, so quite irregular. To illustrate the smallness of some market segments, it is enough to say that in many cases, bright products are produced in single houses over the lifetime. Uh, this simply causes uh, very high cost development uh, per unit. Let me show you some examples of products that we already did. The first one on the left is 25 years old, and this is auto a reading machine for blind persons. The other two are Brightons, quite innovative at the time they were developed many years ago. One is uh, input only, Brightons swim this, and the other is Brighton 12, input and output. And the last one is Jotadot, a product for jotting notes on paper. Currently run projects uh, cover the exit system, uh, a software project that we uh, run together with Institute of Psychiatry and Neurology in, in Warsaw. And uh, it has to, it leads to therapeutic, therapeutic program to support the therapy of prefrontal uh, dysfunctions. Another AAL project, uh, Guided, is aimed to uh, develop a social interaction platform for elderly people. eSticky, another uh, AAL partner, uh, pro project, so uh, one for uh, aimed to uh, elderly people. Electronic sticky notes for dementia care. Incension, a very ambitious Horizon 2020 project aimed to persons with profound and multiple learning disabilities. Uh, and uh, the, the goal of the project is to produce personalized ICT platform for people with PMD. PMD. And last but not least, Brighton 24 Plus. This one is uh, a new version of the Bright Terminal um, or Bright Note Taker project. The product. Uh, the project is run uh, with external uh, consultants for design, marketing strategy and branding. Now let's try to answer a question. If a project can fulfill expectations of all the parties, uh, so scientific and business, as we see it, Scientists expect from the project to push the science forward and their own career too, probably. They want to mark the project result as a personal achievement. And probably each of them has uh, expects some practical benefits, like maybe a platform for future research or uh, education. While as seen by Harpo, uh, we expect new products that's the most important and uh, the, the product has to be as close to the market as possible we of course learn from other parties uh, but if you uh, look at the reasons we do the projects and compare them with uh, other companies like human where that is many many times bigger you will probably see differences and uh, if you ask them they may have some other 
reasons to uh, to to run projects and also uh, it's a different situation if you mean a software project uh, and hardware if you do some software uh, you can get very close to a marketable product if you uh, run a project with scientists while uh, with hardware is hardly possible because what we get is only a proof of concept and not a real prototype from the last from the past projects we uh, uh, have learned some important lessons uh, we learned that uh, any project we, that we consider must have a good chance to lead to a real product soon after the project we have learned using professional service providers for industrial design, for marketing strategy, for to build a brand too. Uh, the example is the mentioned Brightman 24 project. However, we need to remember that uh, being a medical market, being on the medical market, which seems to many very lucrative market, uh, the prices for services are getting very high. We have simply to uh, remember that and try to uh, stand up to it. Uh, one important factor in uh, running a project that's funded is that it usually has a strict time constraint, which is very good for the final product. As a conclusion, I can say that uh, the project that we want to run has to show a good chance of generating a product soon after the project ends. The future product has to fit our product port portfolio. Uh, the project partners need to be able to run the project activities in an organized way. The time constraint, it is good, but the plan has to be achievable. What are the chances of a product, of a given project uh, to reach the market? Well, I would say we achieved more than 50%. And I think this, this is a good outcome. Someone can ask, why not all? Well, reasons are always different. And that's probably material for a longer presentation. Thank you very much. I'm Jarek Rubinski. Thank you very much. Uh, we are not having that too too many too many seconds um, left for for questions, but uh, we will come back to the questions um, uh, in the coming panel discussion. Um, uh, just want to comment on one question that 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 uh, or just want to emphasize one question. Uh, uh, that uh, came to Anna, uh, and that is about the, in what stage of the product development are end users involved in the um, uh, in the uh, yeah in the, in the plan or in the uh, uh, plan you you you, uh, you sketched. Uh, if it's possible to comment on that, you have one minute in this very large topic. Well, I think <clears throat> it is crucial to have the end user in very, very early uh, because you are to meet the needs of the end user. And I think many projects actually fail because the end user is not enough involved and not early enough. So the earlier, the better, I would say. And then, of course, it depends on context and, and area and so on. Very nice. Many thanks for that. And many thanks to all of you uh, who take part in this session. Uh, we are now uh, approaching uh, um, 50 minutes in, in five, here in Sweden at least. 
So uh, at five o'clock, we start all over again with a very interesting panel discussion that, where you will meet many of the presenters that you have seen uh, during the afternoon again. And uh, uh, questions also will be addressed there. So see you in 15 minutes.